right, what's up everybody? We got uh, another wash and talk. Today we are washing a Model 3. So I believe this is the most basic version you can get. Uh, this belongs to my mom. She never washes it. It's absolutely filthy. So figured today I'd wash it, kind of change things up from the G-Wagon and the, the 5 Series. So, um, And then also I felt like today would be a good day to kind of give you guys a history on me and how I got to be where I am today. Uh, I'm sure some of my you know, followers are, are wondering how does this 27 year old end up with, you know, G-Wagon and these nice cars and, and, and everything. And, um, it's not all on credit. So, um, we'll talk a little bit about that and we'll, we'll get this thing washed up. So, so if you're new here, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Um, I'm into cars and I, uh, I'm into real estate. I have some videos. A lot of times when I'm doing these weekly washes, I talk about real estate and, you know what I'm doing for investments and things like that and then also I have videos that are specific to that so if you're into that you can check out some of my other videos well yeah so I'm 27 years old uh, I live in Phoenix Arizona I came out here in 2012 when I went to ASU and uh, I've been here ever since and so my primary source of income is real estate so real estate sales real estate investments I grew up with a single mom in a place called Palmdale, California. So none of this was handed to me. This was all attained through hard work. Uh, but yeah, I uh, ended up from Palmdale, California. I ended up applying to ASU and, and went to ASU, which isn't much of an achievement in itself. Um, and I joined a fraternity out there. Um, and so that was kind of what I did my first year. I was studying civil engineering, so I got by in my classes, but I was really focused on kind of getting involved in the fraternity thing. But once the fraternity thing kind of got old for me, which was pretty quickly after about my first year of college, I kind of needed a way to like start making money. I wanted to kind of start my life. I didn't want to play the party until I was 24 thing. I wanted to start making money. And so I was working as a bouncer um, at one of the clubs in Scottsdale. And so I was like 18, 19 years old working as a bouncer there. And um, a lot of the people that would come in and spend a lot of money, they would, you know, get bottle service and all that stuff. I would always ask them what they do. And a lot of times the answer was real estate. And so I didn't really know what that entailed, you know, at that age. But, you know, I saw dollar signs and I was like, well, real estate's the way to go. So I got my real estate license, you know. And this is 2012. Um, shoot, I gotta get some freaking bug spray. So yeah, I had uh, saw these people, you know, spending a lot of money, and their income was coming from real estate. And I didn't really know too much, but I figured the, you know, the most logical thing to do at that point was get my real estate license. So got my real estate license, and I read a book called. Uh, Millionaire Real Estate Agent by Gary Keller. And so that book, basically the summary of it is it's a business plan. It's a business plan to become a real estate agent and build a real estate team at Keller Williams Realty. And so that's what I set out to do. I was like, okay, I can, I read the book, it seemed simple enough. And I was like, I could do this. So once I uh, got my real estate license, it took me like nine days. I did the crash course in Arizona and at the time you couldn't do it online, you had to do it in person. And um, so I did it in nine days and then I had already pre-scheduled my test and I got my security clearance card and everything. And so within two weeks I had my real estate license and I did this over summer between my freshman and sophomore year. And so I still went back to school and I started doing, doing real estate, but I didn't really know what to do. Like you get licensed and you don't know like, what should you do? Like what, what like, what do you do every day? Because you join a brokerage and any brokerage will, t will you know, take you, but you're not getting a paycheck and nobody's telling you what to do. So I started, you know, I started looking up stuff online. And, and um, the other thing I did was I looked up the number one agent in Phoenix. And I was like, well, if I can get in front of the number one agent in Phoenix, he can tell me, you know, which direction to go into. So let's move on to the other wheel. So, yeah, so I look up who the number one agent in my market was or, uh, maybe it might have been the number one agent on my brokerage, but so I get the name of the guy and I go to the team leader who's kind of like the, you know, the 
the babysitter of all the agents at the brokerage. And I'm like, hey, I want to go meet this guy. He's a number one agent. Can you get me in touch with him? I want to learn from him. So he kind of puts me off or whatever. But eventually, I keep following up with this guy, and he gets me in touch with him. And so I go and I interview with these guys. And um, initially, you know, they don't really have any interest in hiring me. Um, and they basically turn me down. They're like, you're, you know, 19, 18 years old, and you're a college student, and you're trying to do this part-time. We don't really hire people like that. So they basically told me, like, to get lost, and I'm like, dang it. So I was like, all right, that didn't work. So I'm like, I got to kind of try this out on my own and prove myself. So I start holding open houses for agents, and um, no agent objected to that. And I start getting some leads. And so I get a lead, and I don't really know what to do with it. It's a buyer lead, and they want to buy a house. And at the time, this is 2013. So 2013 was still like a multiple offer market, but you were competing against like institutions a lot of the times. Um, that were buying these as rentals, and the houses were dirt cheap. So I go to the office, I tell people, hey, like, or no, I, I had started showing them homes, so I learned how to show homes, and, and we finally find a house that they want to write an offer on, they're like, all right, we want this house. And I'm like, shoot, I don't, I don't know what to do. So I go to the office, and you know, I tell these people, like, hey, I gotta go talk to my broker, get approval for the offer and everything. I go to the office, I'm like, hey, anybody who can help me with, with this deal, I'll split it with them 50%. So. I, I end up splitting it with this guy. He shows me how to write the offer. Um, he helps me through escrow and everything, and the deal closes. And it was it was October of 2013, I believe, either 2012 or 2013. But I'm going to the office to get my first commission check for my first deal. And I got licensed in August. My first deal is closing in October, and I'm like, I'm ecstatic. Like this money is breathing life into my real estate career. And so I go to pick up my check, and the first person I see when I grab my check and I'm walking out the door is that number one agent that I went to interview with. And he's looking at me, he's like, oh, what's that? And I'm like, oh, it's my first check. I just, just closed a deal. And he's like, oh, like, uh, I'm glad things are working out for you. He's like, uh, like if you want, like, let's go grab lunch. So we end up re-meeting and stuff. And so I end up joining his real estate team um, because he was, he was actually one of the owners of the brokerage. But I joined his real estate team. And so I start getting plugged into all their systems. And um, a lot of people are warning against it. Like a lot of the people I look up to are saying like, stay out of real estate. Like it's not a good, good choice, stay in college and that kind of thing. And so I go against everything they say and I go, I jump right into it and I join this team and I trust. I'm like, this guy's doing it, he's successful. If he could do it, I could do it. So I go into it with this blind confidence, but I'm a fish out of water. I'm 19 at the time. I have no sales experience, no real estate experience, no really work experience at the time, but I go full force into it. I'm like, whatever this guy tells me to do, I'm willing to do it if it gets me to where I wanna be. So let's move on to the other side of the car. So I jump into a full force and so the first thing they had me doing is they had me doing, they're like, all right, to be successful here, you have to make three hours of phone calls um, and they're just straight cold calls. And so I didn't really know what cold calling is. I've seen like boiler room and stuff like that. So I'm excited. So I'm excited to get started calling because uh, I've seen Boiler Room. I loved that movie as a kid. And I'm just like, all right, I'm, I'm here to make money. So I go through their training. I get on the phones. And I'm absolutely terrible. Like, And at the time, like when I joined the team, like there wasn't really, like they were doing a lot of institutional stuff. So there wasn't really anybody up there calling with me. I was just kind of out there by myself. And so I just started going for it. I'm like, all right, I got a call for three hours a day, even though I didn't know what I was doing. And, um, and I was terrible at it. I get on the phone, I'm using the script. It's basically like, hi, my name's John. I'm with Keller Williams Realty. Uh, this is a business call. Cause I had read like some 1980s script online. And as you can imagine, I'm just getting hung up on left and right. Literally nobody wants to talk to me or give me the time of day. And nobody should have. Um, and so, I find out that like people in the office had bets on how long it would be until I quit because I was just so bad. But eventually I just kept going. And I would just have extreme anxiety going into the office and, and, and I would finish my calls for the day and the anxiety wouldn't go away because I was already thinking about the calls I had to make for the next day. I would just be like, God dang it, I have to do this all over again tomorrow. 
and it was just really a tough experience for me. Uh, and it was really discouraging, but I just, for some reason, I stuck with it. I did not give up. And I think part of that is like my vision of where I wanted to go was so clear. I was like, this is what I have to do to get there. So I'll just, I'll do it. And so I, I stuck with it. And um, eventually people are like, all right, we got to help this kid. Like if we're going to sit here and listen to him in the office talk, like at least let it be halfway decent. So I get some help and I start getting some traction. And um, eventually I start setting appointments and I start getting some deals. And so once I start getting some deals, um, I end up going to... Um, I, I go to the office on like a Labor Day weekend or something, Memorial Day weekend, and there's another guy from the, from the team in the office, and he's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, oh, I got nothing better to do. I'll just make some phone calls. So we make phone calls together, and he sees that I have a uh, Tony Robbins book. And so he ends up giving me a ticket to Tony Robbins, and there's a whole big thing where I end up shaking Tony Robbins' hand, and I'll save that story for another video. But... Um, I start bonding with other guys on the team and I start making more and more progress. And so they start giving me actual real leads to handle. Um, and so on top of the cold calling I was doing, I was getting actual leads from these guys and I started converting some of the leads. I'm converting the leads I'm getting from cold calling and everything starts to work. And within a year, I, I, I had my first month where I closed five transactions in one month. And so that happened to be the summer uh, after my sophomore year. And so I make the decision that I'm going to drop out of college. I'm not going to continue with civil engineering anymore. I'm going to go full force into real estate, and I'm going to leave college behind with the thought that, hey, if this real estate thing is a complete failure, I could always jump back into college and become a civil engineer. But I've got the opportunity in front of me right now, and i got to run with it. So, uh, again, everybody warned against me, uh, my, my family, my friends. A lot of people were skeptical of it, but I did it anyways, and I just disappeared. I moved out of my college dorm. Uh, where I was living with my friends, I moved into a one-bedroom apartment, and all I did was focus on learning sales, and I would buy sales programs, I would go to sales seminars, and I would listen to my calls that I record, uh, that were recorded from the day, because um, I was using a dialer, and I just obsessed over it every single day. I would just make more and more phone calls, and eventually I got to the point where it was time to hire a showing agent. Uh, so the team already su supplied like support staff, like a transaction coordinator. But so I was getting to the point where I was setting so many appointments where I needed a showing agent to show my buyers homes. So that was like my first hire and I hired them on a commission basis. I would just give them a percentage of the commission I was, I was earning um, based on whichever clients they were showing. And so from there, my business went to the next level. And so I continued in residential real estate. Um, in my last year in residential real estate, I sold 93 homes in one year. And um, to understand the magnitude of that, like, when you sell 93 homes, that means you probably had like 200, 250 clients because not every deal that you put in escrow closes, not every person that you meet with goes to, or not every home that you show, you know, goes under contract and not every, you know, person you show homes to buys with you and so on and so forth. So you have all these extra clients that you never end up doing business with, but you spend time on. So I had this massive year and um, I kind of felt like I was getting into a dead end where I was going to just you know, I was working 24 seven and I wanted, uh, you know, something bigger. So I started looking into real estate, uh, commercial real estate. And that's when, um, I discovered like Grant Cardone and, and, um, you know, different people in the commercial real estate, specifically multifamily. And I made the decision I was going to stop doing real residential real estate. Um, if I got a residential real estate lead, I was going to refer it out to somebody else and take a referral fee and I was going to focus 100% on commercial real estate. And so I made that choice and I ended up joining a, a commercial real estate firm. And uh, when I first interviewed with them, they didn't really want to hire me. They, they thought that, you know, like, hey, this guy's residential. We don't really have room for you in Phoenix multifamily. So I looked at their Tucson team and their Tucson team had been struggling. So I offered to do work in Tucson and they were like, you know what? I didn't think of that. That's awesome. And so my plan was to start in Tucson and work my way to Phoenix. But what ended up happening is I discovered Tucson was such a great market and so ripe and that I could really wedge myself in, in kind of a, a void in the market and, and make more progress than I would have in Phoenix. And so I started doing my thing in, in, uh, in Tucson multifamily out there, and it started going really well. My first, like, 60 days at that brokerage, I took three listings, three multifamily listings, 
one of them was like 54 units um, for a few million dollars. So um, let's move on to this next wheel. So I start to get some pretty good momentum with the multifamily in Tucson. And so I just, I keep running with it. And I realized in commercial, it's like, all right, I can kind of make similar money doing like half the work. Um, because like your, your deal size is just, your average deal size is just way bigger. So you end up being able to, you know, have less overhead, have less support staff because instead of doing 90 deals a year, I was doing, you know, 10 or 15 and I was making two or three times the money doing that because I didn't have all the, the, the staff to pay. And so I start running with that and I start getting good and um, I realize how good of a market Tucson is. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna stick with Tucson. I'm not gonna move up to Phoenix. And uh, the brokerage I was at, which was a really great multifamily brokerage, but they had very strict rules. They kind of had like their, their team rules and they wanted things to, they wanted me to kind of mend into their, their ecosystem and I didn't really want to. So even though it was a better brokerage, I ended up leaving it and moving to a, a lesser brokerage. This brokerage was, didn't really have any systems or anything in place or, or, or anything to offer other than the fact that they would allow me to do my own thing with no rules. And so I could kind of build up my, my small multifamily team. I didn't have to worry about anybody barking on my back. I just, I go out there and I do my thing. And so that worked really well for me. And, um, you know, that was over the last like two or three years. And so with that, um, you know, I got opportunities to invest in a bunch of different things and, and they turned out well. You guys obviously saw I invested in things like Bitcoin and and um, stuff like that. And I have other business ventures and rental properties and all that. So it ended up working out pretty well for me, uh, switching to commercial. Um, I was working, you know, way less specifically on brokerage and I was making more money and I have less overhead and less risk but I started to feel like the market was getting, you know, overpriced and that we could see a crash. And so I stopped buying and investing in real estate in like 2018, which looking back, obviously it's easier to look back, ended up being a huge mistake. Um, but looking forward, I can, you know, kind of learn from those mistakes and, and make some better choices now. So yeah, I joined the other brokerage, which you know, is, is I, I know going into it, it's, it's not as good as the other brokerage for strictly brokerage, but I get the opportunity to kind of go do whatever I want, basically. So, but, you know, eventually the whatever you want comes to an end, um, you know. So that, that came to an end um, as I started my new business, which you guys have saw, we have a $20 million line of credit and we are buying homes in Tucson, ironically. So Tucson was supposed to be like a, you know, a very limited time kind of thing. And um, it ended up being like my main bread and butter. So the reason why I'm buying in Tucson is because there's a delta between a primary market and a secondary market. And there's also a limit on how quickly those secondary markets grow. You know, they don't grow as fast as the, the, the primary market. So it's very affordable still versus like Phoenix and other markets are still, are just like really unaffordable because they've moved up so fast. They've moved up faster than wages. And so I figure I could buy in Tucson at very affordable prices and just hang on until those prices are n no longer as low. Um, and to give you an example, is like a property in Tucson that rents for 1500 bucks a month, you can buy for, you know, say 175,000 versus to get that same property that produces $1,500 in income in Phoenix, you're going to pay 375,000. So if you want to leverage your, your opportunity with debt, it becomes really hard when the, when the market is so lopsided like that. 
and obviously rents are going up, you know, so that, um, and the prices in Tucson are going up, so that delta slowly closes, but as it closes, I want to be an owner, and so I decided now is a good time to make the switch from being a broker to primarily being an owner. So yeah, I know a lot of people are kind of scared to get in the market right now because prices are so high, but I look at this like the opportunity I missed when I first got in real estate. I think prices are very low compared to what they're gonna be. And I know a lot of people think the opposite, but this market is way different than 2007 and 2008. And it's not because they're not doing subprime lending and all that stuff. It's because the variables in the market are different. So back in 2007, 2008, they were overbuilding like crazy. So there was a ton of homes under construction. And as more and more inventory came to the market, pricing continued to still go up. So the market was shifting. But because they were giving these bad loans and nobody thought prices could go down, the market continued to swing up. The other thing is the average interest rate during that time was like 6 7%. Versus now, it's like 2 3 4 if you're just talking to the wrong people on residential at least. So you have overbuilding that doesn't exist now, they're underbuilding right now, especially in Tucson. And interest rates are way lower. And then on top of that, the money supply is different. So there's way more liquidity in the market than there was back then. We had COVID and we had the Great Recession where the Fed printed a ton of money. So you have way more money in the marketplace, way more liquidity in the marketplace, which leads to these lower interest rates, but also an increase in price because now more buyers have, oops, have access to the money and can afford the monthly payments because the interest rates are lower. And then the cost to rebuild all this stuff has gone up. But even though I think the prices are still low in places like Phoenix, I still want to take advantage of the secondary markets. And you can too. Like if you're in California or you're anywhere other than, than Arizona, you can look in other markets that are similar to Tucson. Like find the Tucson of Los Angeles or the Tucson of Dallas and go make your opportunities that way. Um, because if you just sit on the sidelines and wait for the market to crash, you're gonna miss five, six years of progress. And so if you're 35 right now and you wait five years to start investing, you're gonna be 40, say the market crashes in five years, you're gonna be 40 and you missed five years of earning in investments to now potentially go get one property under value because the recessions don't last as long as the um, the good markets. The good markets last, you know, eight, 10 years. The recessions last one, two years. So how much progress are you gonna be able to make in that one, two years of recession versus the progress you can make in the eight, 10 years of, of uh, whatever they call it. So, I think right now we still have a long runway. I think prices are low compared to what they're gonna to go to. So I'm gonna to continue to buy. I'm not gonna miss this opportunity like I did my first time around. And I'm just gonna to try to get as much assets as possible because the value of the dollar is going down. So the only way I can keep my financial energy is to deploy it in assets and commodities. And the best asset class I know is real estate. So, and I know Tucson better than most people. So 
that's kind of where I'm headed. But let's get this rinsed off and dried off. So yeah, that's kind of the quick and fast story of how I got to be where I'm at right now. To some people, it might seem like a downgrade to go back to doing residential stuff. But really, like what I'm trying to do is commercialize residential investment because, I mean, the only people that are doing it are the institutions. And nobody really benefits from that other than the institutions. There's a great place to do it, Tucson. And I have all the skills to make it happen. And I have all the resources. So eventually I want to be able to do it where I could bring you guys in too, you know, like my friends and family and the people watching. But right now that's just not feasible. So in the meantime, at least I could tell you guys what I'm doing. So then that way, you know, if you're ambitious enough or you're motivated enough, you'll go make it happen or you'll call me and want to learn and I can help you make it happen versus right now it seems most of my friends want to get involved in real estate but they're all just standing on the sidelines waiting for something big to happen and most of you guys are my age so even if something big did happen or the market crashed we're young enough we could weather the storm take our stories our scars our lessons with us and make even more money it's like, because if you think about it, like, if COVID were to happen again, we'd all be more prepared for what COVID would bring us. You know? So if you go invest in real estate, your first deal will teach you exactly what to do for your second deal. And your third deal and your fourth deal. and But... Your first deal is not going to look like your 10th deal. And so I know a lot of people try to make that happen, but it just doesn't. So you have to, you're going to have to make some mistakes in real estate investing. And, but the main thing, the biggest mistake I see people making, which is the easiest to fix, is they just don't take any action. They don't get started. You know, especially when you're young, just get started. And it's like people are so afraid of losing money and going broke. And it's like, I hate to break it to you, but most of you, including myself, were already broke. Like... A lot of us are one really bad day away from being broke again. Or already broke. So even if you think you got money, you don't have money. Sometimes I think I got money. And then I'm reminded, I don't got no money. So, but that's what wakes me up every day. That's why I'm going after it, chasing and pushing. Because I know... The money I have right now is enough, and sometimes it feels like it's more than enough, but when shit hits the fan, it ain't going to be enough. You know, and that's really the case for anybody whose net worth is like under 10 million bucks. I mean, being a millionaire is kind of like the new middle class. You know, some of us don't want to admit it, but it's the truth. Yeah, stop being afraid to lose money, stop being afraid of going broke. Newsflash, you're already broke. But, yeah, that's kind of my quick life story. So, appreciate you guys watching. Make sure you like the video. Subscribe to the channel. Check out my other videos on real estate and cars. And um, let me know down in the comments what you guys want to see. And uh, so, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching. I'm just really trying to show you new love. Say you tired and you need a new love. Use what you got for your lose love. See new things with your views up, yeah.